Okay, so we'll take an another look at a different page from the Lindisfarne Gospels. It's folio 25 verso. Um, tempera on vellum. So tempera paint is made with egg yolk, I believe, mixed with pigment. Um, vellum, I think, is similar to parchment. Um, they're both animal skin, but I want to say vellum is from young animals or young lambs or something, something a little bit more specific. And parchment is more of just animal skin. Um, so anyway, continue on talking about this piece here that features St. Matthew. Um, we've seen him before, and he was definitely not done in the same style. Um, the, the other St. Matthew that we looked at was much more um, abstracted, much more not as realistic looking, included a lot more pattern in his cloak. This one has more classical influences, and we'll talk about this in more detail. It's much more class classical in his representation, um, which is different than the St. Matthew that we looked at in the Book of Durham. So art historians think that the inspiration for this, illust the, this illustration or the illuminator that made this illustration was either an illustrated gospel book that a Christian missionary brought along to, from Italy, or possibly a manuscript modeled after a Mediterranean book. So something that's directly from the Greco-Roman world, um, just because it has so many Greco-Roman influences in it. And author, author portraits were definitely very common in Greek and Latin books. Greek books had similar representations of seated philosophers or poets writing or reading. So this has got a lot of, not only is the subject, the way that it's rendered, um, very Greco-Roman, but also the subject matter of him sitting and reading is very, um, has parallels in Greek books as well. So, so the Linens Farn Matthew sits in his study, writing in his lap. Uh, curtain sets the scene indoors as it might in classical art. So the, the use of the folds in the drapery um, is an influence from classical Greece or Rome. And Matthew's seat is also set at an angle which also suggests the classical employment of perspective, which would have come from the Mediterranean cultures of either Greece or Italy. Um, the Linens Farm Illuminator made this subject exclusively in terms of line and color, so he didn't include any, or she didn't, it was probably a man though, um, didn't include shading at all. So there's no value, there's no shade in this. Um, and in this Hiberno-Saxon manuscript, the drapery folds are a series of regular, regularly spaced curving lines filled with flat colors. So the painter really kept in the tradition of insular art. And he did not try to make this a realistic representation. The artist also included text that identifies the saint using a combination of Greek and Latin. And they're really not sure why the combination of Greek and Latin is used. Um, was the artist a scribe copying words from two different sources, or was the combination of Greek and Latin intentional, you know, perhaps to lend to the page um, the prestige of, of two classical languages? Um, the former was the language of the New Testament, and the latter was the language of the Church of Rome. Um, so Latin dominates definitely on this page, though. There is some Greek, but there's also more Latin present than Greek. We're not sure who this third f figure is. Um, it's been suggested that it might be Christ or possibly Saint Cuthbert, um, but the most supported theory is the Old Testament prophet Moses. So according to the suggestion that this is Moses, Moses is holding the closed book of the Old Testament in contrast with the open book of Matthew's New Testament. So they're really thinking that this is Moses. And this is actually something that's a common juxtaposition in other medieval art, so that's why they're thinking that that's Moses. Um, this is obviously an angel. They don't name which angel this is in the book, but I mean, it's, it probably is a specific angel. Um, so we're going to move on from the manuscripts and talk about the high crosses of, Hiberno, of the Hiberno-Saxon world. Um, they're typically found in... Ireland and Northern England, and they were set up between the 8th and 10th centuries, and they're really kind of exceptional. They're quite large, unlike most of the art from this period. A lot of the stuff that we have surviving is quite small, 
Um, so it's nice to have something that's larger. Um, their scale makes them unique for their time period. And some of them reach up to 20 feet high, and they're typically present in the burial grounds adjoining Hiberno-Saxon monasteries. And they're freestanding, and they have the presence of both a building and a statue, so kind of an architectural and sculptural form combined into one piece. So this is the High Cross of Myrdok, East Face, um, from Munster Boyce, Ireland. 923 sandstone. Um, so this piece here um, is the largest of the two that we're going to look at and it's a really great example um, because of the narrative relief decoration that's present on its surface. And they believe, many historians believe that the reliefs are inspired by the reliefs that were found on early Christian stone sarco sarcophagi. Irish missionaries probably encountered these early Christian stone sarcophagi during their travels. Um, one thing to note though is that the subject matter of the, the reliefs on the cross are much different than what you would find on an early Christian stone sarcophagi. So the subject matter is completely different, um, but it could be, um, you know, inspired by early Christian stone sarcophagi. So an inscription on the bottom of the west face of the shafts asks a prayer for a man named Myrdok. Um, most scholars identify him as the influential Irish cleric of the same name, who is an abbot of Monastar Boyce and died in 923. The monastery he headed was one of Ireland's oldest, founded in the late 5th century, and the cross probably marked his grave. So there's kind of four arcs that form a circle here around the cross shape, which the cross shape kind of ends in these square terminals here, all the way around, squared off. And the circle intersecting the cross identifies the type as a Celtic cross. Um, the center of the west side of the cross is a depiction of the crucified Christ. So there he is. Um, and on the east side, the Christ is risen and stands as judge of the world, uh, the hope of the dead. And below him is a depiction of the weighing of souls on scales, a theme that will continue in later Christian art. And actually, I don't know if this is the crucifixion side or if this is the... Christ has risen side. It kind of looks like he has a sword in his um, running through him. So I'm kind of thinking this might be maybe the crucifixion side, but I can't really see a scale anywhere either. So let's see here, east face. So this is the east side. So that would be Christ stands as judge of the world. So that's what side this depicts then him, him being judge of the world and weighing, weighing souls on a scale. This is the other cross, the south cross. Um, from Aheny, Ireland, late 8th century sandstone as well. It's made out of sandstone. It's um, doesn't require, it doesn't have the narrative reliefs as, like the other cross does, but it's still pretty impressive. It's 12 foot, nine and a half inches high, so it's quite large and um, quite impressive as well. So those are the two crosses that we were going to look at, Hiberno crosses. Hiberno um, Saxon crosses. But that pretty much wraps up this section of the chapter. And then next week, we'll continue forward with the rest of the chapter. I wanted to split it up because it's, stuff is just really dragging on this semester. And everybody's kind of, I think everybody in my other classes for sure, and I'm sure the same is true with this one, is are, everybody's getting kind of tired. So I figured I would kind of split everything up. Makes it easier for you. And honestly, it's easier for me as well. So <clears throat> anyway, we'll talk to you later. Have a good rest of your week.